Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to Gettysburg National Military Park. I'm John Hoptak. I'm a park ranger here with the battlefield. I've been with the National Park Service for the past nine seasons. Three of the seasons here at Gettysburg and the prior six, I've worked at Antietam National Battlefield in Maryland. Real pleasure to be with you this hot afternoon. As the old saying goes, it's not the heat, it's the humidity, right? <laughs> kind of a sticky day. Uh, the forecast for today called for 80% chance of rain every hour. So, well, I'm 20% chance that it wouldn't. So we got lucky. We got lucky today. This program is entitled Care of the Wounded. And I plan to spend about 45 minutes out here talking about uh, the various techniques that were employed during the war and especially here at the Battle of Gettysburg to tend to the sick and to the wounded. Now, is there anyone here currently employed or formerly employed in the medical field? Okay, that's what I was afraid of. <laughs> Because I'm not. Uh, I am not a doctor. I don't even play one on television. In fact, the whole thought about going to a doctor makes my palms sweat a little bit. Okay, But I was told to develop this program, so I'm going to do the best I can. When you think of Civil War medicine, when you think of Civil War surgery, what is the very first thought that pops into your head? Amputation. Amputation. Anything else? Pain and agony. Pain and agony. Yeah, very good. Any other words or descriptions that we might? Lack of sanitation. Lack of sanitation. That's a good one. Ooh. Very Ooh. Infections, disease, screaming. screaming pain. Now I ask you, is it a pleasant image that we have? When we think of Civil War surgeons, we tend to think of the grim and the gruesome. We think of the bone saw. We think of the doctors being referred to as butchers. And I'll tell you, this was nothing new. That's nothing new today in 2014, even during the war itself. Many of these doctors had a bad reputation, okay? They tried their best, but still, the soldiers in the ranks, they did not want to find themselves in a field hospital, okay? Now, I think, I think it's a rather unfair view, which kind of brings me to the theme, if you will, of this program. And it's the fact that these Civil War doctors and surgeons, they labored so hard with tremendous disadvantage. But they still did the best they could with what they knew and with what they had. And as you tour the battlefield today, you're gonna to see over a thousand monuments, statues, plaques, memorials. How many statues do you think you'll find of a surgeon? <laughs> not a one, of a doctor, nothing, not even a nurse. So these Civil War doctors and surgeons, I think, were some of the unsung heroes, if you will, of the American Civil War. I want us to go back, take a step back to Wednesday, July 1st of 1863. That was the first day of this battle. And on that Wednesday, there's a total of 28,000 Confederate troops approaching the town of Gettysburg. Now the town itself, just about a mile or so away to the right, to the north of us. 28,000 Confederates approaching town from the north and from the west, and approaching town from the south about 16,000 Union troops. Among those Union troops was the Union Army 11th Corps. And most of the history books will follow in the footsteps of these men as they made their way through the town of Gettysburg and deployed on the fields north of town. Yet even as the soldiers were rushing forward, being cheered on by the people of town along the way, even as all of that was going on, about three quarters of a mile to the south of us, to your left, the doctors, the surgeons of the 11th Corps are galloping up the long driveway that belonged to George and Elizabeth Spangler. George Spangler was an area farmer. He was out tending to his orchard when that Wednesday morning his life was about to get turned upside down. The doctors will arrive and they will commandeer his farm. And even as the battle is raging to the north, they are transforming George Spangler's farm into a field hospital. This will occur all around Gettysburg, almost a behind the scenes kind of activity as the action is raging. Now the doctors will remove doors from hinges. They will establish amputating tables, operating tables. And on July 4th, just three days later, the Battle of Gettysburg is ended. 8,000 men lie dead on the fields of battle. More than 22,000 are wounded, being cared for at over 113 hospitals that had been established in the area, including the Spangler Farm. 
And on that Independence Day, it was the exact opposite weather conditions than today. Gloomy, overcast, cloudy, and rainy. And the rain picked up after 12 o'clock noon. In the midst of that rain, an 11th Corps general by the name of Carl Schurz decided to pay a visit to his wounded men who were being cared for at the Spangler farm. And here's a description he left of what he saw while there. See how much this matches up with that image in your mind of a Civil War surgeon. At Gettysburg, said Schurz, the wounded, many thousands of them, were carried to the farmsteads behind our lines. The houses, the barns, the sheds, and the open barnyards were crowded with the moaning human beings. And yet still, an unceasing procession of stretchers and ambulances was coming in from all sides. A heavy rain set in during the day, and large numbers of the wounded had to remain unprotected in the open. There was no room left for them under roof. The water was pouring down upon their bodies. Most of the operating tables were placed out in the open where the light was best, only some of them partially protected by the rain. And there stood the surgeons, their sleeves rolled up and their bare arms and their aprons smeared with blood. Their knives not seldom held between their teeth as they helped a patient on and off the table. And around them, at their feet, pools of blood and amputated arms and legs in piles. Carl Schurz left a pretty graphic, pretty vivid image of a Civil War field hospital. And today it sounds grim. It sounds rather gruesome. But what he was describing there was actually a state-of-the-art kind of improvement as to where we were when this war first began. So now we'll take one more step back two years prior to the Battle of Gettysburg to 1861 when the war got started. When the war began that April, the entire army of the United States numbered about 15,000 men. They were spread out across the country at various frontier posts like at Fort Leavenworth in Kansas, or Fort Brown, Texas, or of course, Fort Sumter down in South Carolina. Of the 15,000 troops assigned to the Army or positioned with the Army, there were 30 surgeons. 30 surgeons. The largest military hospital was at Fort Leavenworth with 41 beds. Now all of a sudden, the war got started. Tens of thousands of young and old men rush out to the recruiting stations to volunteer, to sign up to fight. By the end of the war, nearly three million soldiers would fight. And by the end of the war, there would be 11,000 surgeons, as opposed to 30 when they first began. 4,000 surgeons for the Confederacy. When you were hoping to enter the medical profession in the years before the Civil War, it was much different than it is today. If you expressed an interest in pursuing a career in medicine, you would enroll at a medical school. There were a total of 40 medical schools in 1860, 32 of them in states in the north, eight in the south. You paid an enrollment fee, and then you would attend lectures given by practicing physicians. You would pay admission tickets to sit in on these lectures, about a year's worth of lecture. The next year, you would come back and you'd do the same thing you would hear the same lecture. After that, you took an exam. If you passed the exam, guess what? You're a doctor. Just like today, right? A Little bit different. Uh, you could also uh, achieve your medical license by an apprenticeship, by following along with a practicing physician, making house calls, going door house to house, tending to the elderly or to the young, perhaps setting a broken bone from a, a horse kick on the farm, but nothing quite preparing you for what this, what flying lead and flying iron through the air would do to a human body. Of those 11,000 doctors I talked about by war's end, less than 1% had any kind of pre-war surgical experience. So you want to talk about learning on the job. At the first Battle of Manassas, it became quite apparent that things would have to change. Because at the first Battle of Bull Run, some of the wounded of the Union Army lay on the fields. Okay, this was July of 1861 for up to eight days before they were finally removed. 
The army at that point, well, the Surgeon General believed that they wouldn't have to change the way things are done. Okay? He, he employed private citizens to follow in the wake of the army to these battlefields, hopefully that they could use their wagons to help transport the wounded. There was no established ambulance corps. The stretcher bearers, well, they assumed would be the drummer boys. Okay, put down the drum, put down the fife, what have you, and these 14, 15 year old kids would go to the front to remove these mangled men, these heavy soldiers, even as shells were bursting overhead. They were not quite ready for this war. Both sides, north, south, were underprepared and quickly overwhelmed. Changes would be coming though. Changes would be coming. This war is a learning experience in a lot of respects. We talked about the tactics changing. As you tore the field, many of you would stand looking across the fields of Pickett's Charge and you wonder how in the world would they ever do that? March across those open fields, shoulder to shoulder, linear formations. Well, you know, they're going to abandon that. In fact, by the following year, by the spring of 64, they're beginning to dig in. Trenches, siege warfare, it was a whole different kind of war as they changed, as they adapted. Well, these surgeons and doctors, they're going to adapt the way they do things as well. But most of us, when I asked about what you thought about Civil War surgery and Civil War doctors, amputation, how they cared for the wounded, but most of the time what they were doing, they were caring for the sick, the ill. There weren't battles fought every day, of course, but every day soldiers fell ill. Throughout the four years of this conflict, over 600,000 soldiers perished. I think the numbers should be higher. But if we take that accepted number, 620,000, over 400,000 of that figure died from disease. So for every soldier killed on a battlefield, two died from disease or some kind of infection. Now I ask you, why was disease so widespread? Why was disease so prevalent during the Civil War? What do you think? There was no antiseptic. There was no cleaning of the, wet, of the hmm. instruments. There was no knowledge of how infection started. Yeah, there's no knowledge of germs. That's absolutely right. They have absolutely no idea what germs, microbes, viruses were. Okay, of course we know to wash our hands before we eat a meal. Okay, after we use the restroom. They didn't know that. Okay, they didn't know what germs were. They didn't know diseases spread that way. Now there is a transition in medicine at this time. They're beginning to enter a more scientific age, but even so, there was no knowledge of germs. The work of Dr. Lister, that was still 10, 15, 20 years down the road. So, germ theory, not yet known. What else? What do you think? They had no immunity, a lot of them. A lot of them had no immunity, yes. What do we mean by that? Well, 48% of all Civil War soldiers, nearly half, came from the farm. They came from rural areas. Their nearest neighbor might have lived half mile away. Their contact with human beings up to this point limited to their own family or perhaps if they went into a market town every now and then. But now all of a sudden the war begins and you have hundreds of thousands of these kids from rural areas going off to fight. They put them onto trains and they send them to Richmond or to Washington and they put them in camp next to troops that were coming from the streets of New Orleans and Boston and Philadelphia. Those who had been exposed more as youngsters to diseases that we today call childhood illnesses like whooping cough, like measles and so on. That would kill tens of thousands of soldiers. And it has been shown that soldiers from rural areas, agricultural areas, were more susceptible to those diseases than those from urban areas. What about the overcrowded conditions in camp? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we are packed together in camps, in tents. If we're going into winter quarters, or perhaps if we're going to be encamped in one area for a long time, we might be sharing our tent with 10, 11 people. Close quarters, close confined spaces. The rules and regulations stated that we were to dig our latrine about 30 feet away from our camp. It makes sense, right? Eight foot deep, every night we throw a fresh layer of dirt over top just to keep the a little bit clean. But I ask you, if you had just finished a 15 mile hike, 15 mile march, you settle into camp, you establish your tent, the last thing you want to do is what? 
dig, dig latrines, and then walk at least 30 feet away to use the latrines, you know, throughout the evening and night. Camps became dirty places. The soldiers would toss their food, okay, and uneaten food out into the open. Flies, bugs became attracted to these camps. How often do you think the soldiers are washing their clothing? Not very often at all. How often do you think they're washing their bodies? Not that often either. Their diet was incredibly poor, high in calories, very low in nutrients and vitamins. So we're beginning to see why illness would be so widespread. And it was. 400,000 died in those four years from disease. And the number one killer that killed more soldiers than bullets and bayonets and bombs was diarrhea. Diarrhea killed nearly 40,000 Civil War soldiers by the time this war was done. The doctors would spend most of their time diagnosing the sick. Every morning there would be a sick call and he would try to treat the ill. He would assign medicines. Early on in the conflict, one of the medicines that the doctors gave out, especially for those complaining of bowel or stomach issues, was called calomel. Calomel, an ingredient of calomel, the soldiers called it the blue mass. It was this kind of thick, blue, chalky substance that they would carve a piece off. And this was the era they called of heroic dosing. <laughs> so it doesn't matter how much medicine your body could tolerate. It depended how sick you were, okay? They're not weighing you. So they're giving you this blue mass, this calomel. An ingredient of that was mercury. So early on, early on, sometimes the treatment was worse than the symptoms. But changes were coming. Okay? In 1862, a new Surgeon General will come take charge of the U.S., of the Army. You won't find statues or monuments to him. You won't find his name mentioned that often in the history books, but his name was William Hammond. He was a medical doctor. He was 33 years old. And when William Hammond took charge as Surgeon General, he began to make some immediate and widespread changes that had an immediate effect on the men in the field and for years to come. He began to raise the bar a little bit about what you needed in terms to becoming a doctor. You know, prior to this, if we raise a regiment of a thousand men, we can't be mustered into service until we have at least one physician in our regiment and an assistant surgeon and a hospital steward. And sometimes the men would just volunteer to do this with little medical background at all. So he raised the bar, if you will. He raised the standards a bit. Uh, he required that his doctors keep track and chart what was working and what wasn't. He established a National Health and Science Museum in Washington. Now, Dr. Hammond also would outlaw certain medicines, including calomel. Do away with it. It's causing more damage than good. But 33 years old, he began to run afoul of some of the doctors <laughs> that he was now in charge of doctors who had been practicing for longer than he had been alive. He rubbed people the wrong way, and he'll actually be dismissed two years later for conduct unbecoming an officer. But the changes that he began to institute would have an impact immediately on the soldiers in the field. One of those changes also was bringing this guy on board, 38-year-old Dr. Jonathan Letterman. Dr. Letterman was a graduate of Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, one of those 40 medical schools that I talked about earlier. Thomas Jefferson University was co-founded by a fellow named Dr. George McClellan. For those of you who study the war, you might know his son, General George McClellan. And at that point in 1862, George McClellan was commanding the Army of the Potomac. Hammond appointed Letterman as chief medical director of that army, and when he arrived, Dr. George McClellan the general said, do whatever it takes, change the way things are done. And he would. He would establish a uniform ambulance corps. Okay? He will uh, widen the size of ambulances to accommodate more passengers. Up to this point, the regulation stated that there would be one ambulance assigned for every thousand men. Now there's going to be two. After Gettysburg, he'll increase it to three. He is going to train stretcher bearers. No more relying just upon these young kids, these drummers, to remove the wounded from the field. He called upon volunteers to trade in their weapons of soldiers and pick up 
stretchers, litters, to ride or drive the ambulance teams. And they were trained very specifically in what they were to do. You know, there was a science behind this. Not just rolling a man onto a stretcher and running as fast as you can, but taking a good measured step by step, beginning with your left foot so there's no bouncing. Introduce shocks on the wheels of the ambulances to lessen the bumps away, away, back. And he is going to insist that everyone adopt a triage system. Now triage systems had been in play in Europe in the Crimean War the previous decade. He was paying attention to this. And there were some organizations within the army, some units that were doing it, but he would make it universal so that every brigade, every division would do this. Remember how I began today talking about the Spangler Farm being set up as a field hospital? Well, that's where the trained surgeons were. And they would establish that as a core hospital. Early on in the war, if you belonged, let's say, to the 45th New York Infantry and you fell wounded on the battlefield, guess what you had to do? You had to go find your doctor of the 45th New York. Okay? It was at a regimental level. He made it a divisional level and a corps level, okay? So those soldiers who belonged to the 11th Corps, they knew that their field hospital would be established at the Spangler Farm. The ambulance drivers knew where it was. And as the troops made their way to the front, behind them would be the assistant surgeons. And they would make forward aid stations very near to the front lines. The men of the 11th Corps have rushed forward, they halt, they form a line of battle, and as they're beginning to load their muskets, maybe 30, 40 yards in the rear, in a sheltered ravine behind some large rocks, or perhaps in some kind of structure, the assistant surgeon would establish one of these aid stations. And that is where he would make these split-second, on-the-spot decisions about life and death. Because it wasn't long before the wounded came trickling back. Let's see. Sir, what's your name? Tobias. Tobias, can I have you be soldier number one? Okay. What's your name? Calvin. Calvin, can I have you be soldier number two? Okay. All right, pardon me. You, sir, what's your name? Gregory. Gregory, can you be number three for me? And your name? James. James, can you be soldier number four? Very good. So now I'm the assistant surgeon. And I have just established my forward aid station. Soon, the battle began. The shells began to burst. The bullets came thick. And now the wounded come back. Tobias, come forward, please, and explain to me what has happened to you. Uh-oh. <laughs> A shell exploded over my head, and a piece of shrapnel tore into my skull. Yeah, it sure did. I tell you what, soldier. I tell you what we're going to do. You can rise, sir. You kind of made you kind of made the assistant jobs easy because your life expired at that moment. But what I would do, what I would tell you is I would have a quick look and I would realize that yes, this is a very severe case. Sar or Sergeant Tobias, can you please sit over here and we will get to you, sir? Uh, where is soldier number 2? Yes, sir. Um, I was charging the enemy and a canister ball struck me and tore into my stomach. That wasn't good. This is a canister ball. Have a feel of that. Tell the folks here how that feels. It's pretty heavy. Pretty heavy. Yeah, I tell you what, can you jar join Sergeant Tobias? We'll get to you, sir. <laughs> Tobias, and remind me again, Calvin? Yeah. Tobias and Calvin both received artillery wounds. And artillery accounted for about 9% of all Civil War injuries. Uh, cannonballs. This is a cannonball. This is an unexploded cannonball. You can see the fuse still on the top. Tobias, hold that for me. How does that feel? Uh, pretty, really heavy. Pretty, really heavy, <laughs> yes. These were timed to explode. And even though when you watch movies, you might see a long line of men marching and the ground like explodes at their feet. Well, these were timed to explode over your head, okay? You don't want these going down into the ground and burrowing deep under the soil. And when these exploded, they would break apart into jagged, hot pieces of iron that would rain down and cut through shoulders, cut through chest, cut through heads, like Sergeant Tobias here. 
If you got close toward the enemy lines, they would resort to canister fire. A coffee can that was packed with 20 to 30 iron balls. Some were the size of marbles, other the size larger ones like golf balls. And when you fired the can and close, the casing evaporated and the uh, iron balls just kind of strewed out. He caught one in the stomach. You caught one in the head. Unfortunately, there's little we could do to help. So we would kind of set them aside with a promise of returning to help them. Most likely, by the time that happened, your life would have expired. You would have drew your last breath. I could be wrong. Many were wrong. This is a Union general, and his name was Gabriel Paul. You won't find statue to him. He's one of the more obscure generals here at Gettysburg. But on the first day, even as the 11th Corps was setting up their battle line, Gabriel Paul was riding behind his men, helping to place his regiments, when a Confederate bullet entered his head one and a half inches behind his right eye, passed behind his eye and exited his left eye socket. In an instant, blow both eyes were destroyed, shot out. He lost much of his hearing, he lost much of his smell, but he lived for the next 23 years following that horrific wound here at Gettysburg. Here's a post-battle image of Paul, of course missing his eyes. Passed away in 1886, buried today at Arlington National Cemetery. When he died, the attending physician listed his cause of death as the result of the wound he received at Gettysburg over two decades earlier, which begs the question, just how many gave their lives? Do we count Paul among the mortally wounded? So, there's a chance you will make it. Soldier number three, Gregory, am I right? What happened, sir? Well, while on the fire line, and engaging the enemy, a musket ball creased my right hand. While engaging the enemy, a musket ball creased your right hand. Well, sir, I tell you what, we're going to get that bandaged up, and you're going to go back to the firing line. <laughs> so you can go back to your seat. Thank you. And you can keep that with you if you'd like. <laughs> yes, yeah, sometimes the wounded that came back, sometimes they were superficial. Certainly hurt. If you're loading your musket and a musket ball creeps to your skin, it draws blood and the sweat and the dirt stings, okay? It hurts badly. But quite frankly, Private, I don't have time to deal with that kind of wound right now. Some of the soldiers came back complaining about being hit by spent bullets. That means the bullet lost its velocity. And when it struck you, it didn't go in. It just bounced off. It hurt. It knocked the wind out of you. It gave you a black and blue mark. But you would recover. If we're on the firing line, and let's say, just picture a line of soldiers. I'm among them, and I'm loading my musket. Next thing you know, a Confederate bullet comes in, hits me in the thigh, I fall to the ground. There would be no shortage of men, comrades, who want to help me to the rear. Okay? Because that means they do what? They leave the firing line. Which is why it's so important we have our corporals and our sergeants and our file closers behind the line making sure that doesn't happen. And that was especially apparent very early on in the war. Soldier number four, what has happened to you, sir? When, an en uh, when the enemy line fired a volley at 200 yards, a mighty ball struck my right leg below the knee, it feels like the bone is crushed. Yeah, it sure does. I tell you what, we're going to set you over here, okay? You can go back to your seat, actually. <laughs> Thank you. I got good news and bad news for you, Private. The bad news is you're most likely going to lose your leg. The good news is you're most likely going to live, okay? So you can see how at the forward aid station, the assistant surgeon would look at the wound and very quickly say, there or there. And once we got a few folks here, a few of the wounded men, here come the stretcher bearers. 
they would take them back to the ambulance that was waiting. Once the ambulance was loaded, the ambulance driver knew exactly where to go, back toward the Spangler farm where the field hospital had been established. He would ride through town with you in the back in terrible pain. Every bump you hit along the road hurt, hurts even worse. And when you arrived up that long driveway, you looked ahead to the barn and there were the surgeons with their aprons waiting for you. You would be taken off the ambulance and laid in the grass next to one of these operating tables. And one of the reasons why these doctors had such a bad image among the soldiers, before we get to you, we're going to perform three other amputations. And you are going to watch every single moment of it. You will watch as we place a wounded man on one of these tables. You will watch as we try to steady and secure him. You will watch as we apply the anesthesia. One of the myths about Civil War medicine is that there was no anesthesia. When in fact, in over 30,000 documented cases of amputation, anesthesia was used over 90% of the time. It was available both north and south. Sometimes they used ether, most of the time they used chloroform. And from what I've read and from what I've heard, when you have chloroform applied, it feels as though you're drowning, like you're being held underwater. You can't breathe. So you flail about, okay? You twist, you turn until finally you're out. And again, this was the era of what? Heroic dosing. We're not calling in the anesthesiologist. The hope was you would recover, you would wake up. But that always didn't happen. When you travel on the south end of this battlefield, you'll drive along McGilvery Avenue. Freeman McGilvery was a Union artillerist here who did a tremendous job on day two with the Union artillery. Fast forward a year. In August of 1864, Freeman McGilvery, this tough sea captain from Maine, was wounded in his right finger. He thought it would heal, but the doctor kept looking at it and it didn't, so they determined they're going to amputate it. Conditions were right, clean hospital. They took Freeman McGilvery back, they applied the chloroform, and he never woke up. They gave him too much. That is how he met his end. Overdose of chloroform. The soldier would be unconscious and then the work of the surgeon would begin. The surgeon would draw from his kit, first of all, just like in today's emergency rooms, we would need to cut away any kind of clothing or uniform from around the wound. Removing the boots, of course, and remember how dirty these uniforms were? caked in dirt, caked in sweat. And when the bullet entered, it carried into the wound and into the body and into the bloodstream pieces of wool, uh, all that dirt that was on the uniform. Some of you might be familiar with a general named Winfield Scott Hancock. On July 3rd, watching his men repulse Pickett's charge, he was sitting on horseback when a bullet hit the pommel of the saddle and it carried into his lower stomach area pieces of wood little nails, and the bullet itself. The wound would have a hard time healing. The wound would discharge pieces of wood every now and then, pieces of uniform. Doctors would probe the wound with their fingers, okay? Their unwashed hands. It wasn't until the following year before a surgeon decided, if we can't locate this bullet, let's have you sit on the back of a horse and let me try it like that. So they put Hancock on horseback, the doctor dug into the wound, and guess what? He found it, and they finally did remove it, okay? But just like Gabriel Paul, there are many who believe that that wound to Hancock here helped to end his life prematurely in the early 1880s, just 20 years later. Either way, the surgeon and his team, the assistant and his steward, would get to work with the process of amputation Tourniquets were applied, of course, to cut off the blood flow to the area. And then we would have to begin to cut away the skin using a knife like this, okay? We would start cutting through the skin, either a circular method or a flap method where we would cut in a triangulation and pull and peel that skin back, okay? That's what we would use to suture back and create the stump, if you will. So we pulled the skin back we would then have to get through the muscle. Sometimes different kind of knives were needed. 
scalpels and such, and they had different kinds and different sizes of knives available, okay, for this. Once the bone was exposed, it would be time to pull out the bone saw. You want to do this quick. One, two, three. Cut through. Get through the bone. Leg bone, arm bone. Once it was removed, the assistant would take the limb and just like Carl Schurz described in our account, would throw it, would toss it. Eventually, that pile of amputated hands, feet, arms, legs would be collected by someone who worked at that hospital, placed in a wheelbarrow and taken somewhere, somewhere for burial. Okay? So the soldier's limb has been removed and after that was done, we would have to make sure that the bone was smooth using bone snips to get away any of the jagged edges. A lot of these knives were not kept as sharp as they should have been. Okay? Cut away the bones jagged edges. We also have a file here where we would file it smooth and after that was done we would have to pull out the vessels, the veins out and we would have to make sure that when we sutured it back up they were out as well. This was being done oftentimes under the most severe circumstances. Not in a clean and sanitized hospital setting but in some cases with artillery shells bursting overhead. As the men screamed and cried, as some of the men woke up halfway through and began cursing and declaring these doctors that they're gonna, they're gonna kill them, okay? <laughs> these doctors would work under these terrible circumstances, doing their best to save as many lives as possible. After the amputation was performed, and by the way, a good doctor could perform an amputation in 15, 20, 25 minutes, okay? It was time for the next soldier. That was you. You just watched three of your comrades <laughs> lose a limb. You're a farmer. All you keep thinking about is your family. How are you going to support your family? How are you going to support your children if you go back home missing your left arm, missing your right leg? This is going to be a whole new life for you and your family. The impact of this battle would go on for decades. Okay? One of the first Corps soldiers who was wounded here on July 1st was being cared for at the Christ Lutheran Church on Chambersburg Street. The church still stands. He wrote that afterwards he watched the same doctor perform amputations for 36 straight hours. Standing on his feet for 36 straight hours. They worked through the night. Lantern, by natural light, they worked when the rain fell. They worked even though they seldom got the recognition or the credit they deserved for doing what they did. The battle ended and the history books will tell you that on July 4th, Robert E. Lee began his retreat from Gettysburg, making his way back south. His campaign had failed. The first part of his army that was removed was his wounded. The Confederate Army would spend much of July 4th gathering in as many of the wounded as possible, those they believed who would survive the journey back home. They placed them into wagons. And just that afternoon, as the rain continued to fall, the wagon train of wounded Confederates left Gettysburg, and the officer in charge of escorting that wagon train claimed that from front to end, there were 17 continuous miles of ambulances. Many hundreds of those Confederates did not survive the journey home. Many died along the way and were buried in farmers' backyards and alongside the road. 8,000 wounded Confederates were left behind for the Union Army doctors to care for. Their work would continue in the days, weeks, and months following. There were 113 hospitals established here in the aftermath of this fight. And as the armies went away, it was up to these doctors, to the nurses, and it was up, it was up to these good Samaritans who arrived here in the wake of the battle, like the Sisters of Charity and the Patriotic Daughters of Lancaster, they helped tend to the wounded, writing letters home to the families, cooking food not only for the wounded men but also for the doctors themselves. Eventually, 
the doctors began to consolidate their wounded, establishing more proper, more fitting hospitals. They began to get removed from the Spangler farm in early August. They were taken to Camp Letterman, the largest field hospital established in the Civil War, east of town, right along the railroad track. Those who recovered enough were sent by train to a larger general hospital, like at Georgetown, okay, or in Washington, or in Philadelphia. Similar general hospitals existed throughout the Confederacy as well. If you recovered from your wound, and the doctor declared that you could return to your regiment, you did. If he declared that you could not perform any further service, you were discharged on disability. Hundreds died in the weeks and months to come. The final wounded soldier will not be removed from the area around Gettysburg until mid-November, four and a half months after the fight. So the work that the was performed after the shooting stopped, you're not going to hear much about it. And when you tour the battlefield, you're not going to see a lot. You won't see the monuments. But what I hope to do today was kind of help reverse that image we have in our heads about these doctors, about these surgeons, who labored under extreme condition, doing what they could with what they knew and with what they had. And I want to thank you so very much for coming along. And let's thank our soldiers here first. And thank you so much. Every day, the National Park Service offers free programs to the public. They're all identified in our park newspaper. Does anyone need a newspaper? Very good. Thank you again. Enjoy the rest of your visit here to Gettysburg. Thank you. Thank you.